We'll start out, since I know some of you here probably haven't seen the film, um, we did a screening a couple weeks ago after the Tri City Film Festival. Uh, the state was kind enough to let me do a, a screening there, just one quick screening, and had a, a great showing. It was a lot of fun. It was really special for me to be able to see it up on that big screen and hear it in that, in that place. Uh, amazing, amazing theater. Um, so I'll play the trailer for you. It's just two and a half minutes, and I'll give you a little bit of a sense of the film, um, which if you haven't seen the film will really kind of help you contextualize everything else we're talking about a little bit. Um, and then I'll give you some background. stuff you might have heard on the radio, but uh, just get everybody up to speed. I um, went to the high school, went to NMC, where my dad taught for 35 years in the English department. Um, and after graduating um, from NMC, I went off to Colorado, uh, to Boulder, uh, and studied uh, at the University of Colorado. I started out doing creative writing there. Um, I was just about to finish up my creative writing degree and, and felt I needed more, so I started doing film critical studies, studying the history and theory of film, um, and ended up getting a dual BA in creative writing and critical studies in film, and that wasn't quite enough for me yet either, so I decided to get a BFA in, in film production as well. Um, and then I liked Boulder so much, and they gave me a really good deal. I was able to teach at the university while I did grad school there as well, so I did an MFA in film production at the University of Colorado as well. Um, and so this film, the film you just saw the trailer for there is uh, was my thesis project, which was an extremely ambitious sort of uh, project. A lot of the, the other grad students were doing, you know, five to ten minute films, and really the reason I went to grad school was to produce a feature. I really wanted to sort of get over that hump and and make something extraordinary. Of course, I am so in love with this area, even though I was in Colorado. My the two larger films I've made. Um, I brought crews from Colorado and we ended up shooting those films here. Because um, when I dream, I dream of Michigan.
Michigan places and Michigan landscapes. So, and landscape is a big role. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the backstory on on Summer West, um, the film itself, a uh, real quick synopsis, it's about a young guy who's got uh, terminal cancer. He's gone through chemo and it didn't work, and so he decides to go out on the road and basically find a beautiful place to spend his final moments. Um, and it's the film, the story is really about the people he meets along the way um, and sort of the connections he makes and the relationships that happen that really sort of open his heart and um, bring about a real transformation in him and the people he meets. Uh, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of the story. Um, it's kind of the journey of the film, which was a 3,000, the journey of the film is a 3,000 mile journey from Traverse City, Michigan, up to the UP, down through Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Badlands, the Black Hills, Devil's Tower, Yellowstone, uh, the Great Salt Lake, and then eventually the Salt Flats is where the film finishes. Um, but the journey of the production started in Boulder, Colorado, and went around and came back to Boulder. So it was actually 4,982 miles, <laughs> according to the RV rental. Um, so that was that was quite a to do. But the story is slightly based on its the film is slightly autobiographical in that the journey of the film sort of follows my journey when I moved from Traverse City to Boulder. So a lot of the locations, some of the situations are taken from that journey, uh, which was a, a very influential two weeks of my life. Um, and just a really, it was an incredible experience. And it's something I always wanted to make a film about, and I really took the leap and, and went after it with this, even though, the, as you'll learn here, the production was sort of insane. It's definitely not a, <laughs> it's not a advised sort of uh, production layout, uh, we'll say. You mean the, the traveling thing? Many elements of it. And I'll get into how I made it sort of work. Like, if you were to ask Mark to budget, you know, a feature film that traveled like this, I mean, I, I can't imagine. I mean, to move the company, you know, 5,000 miles, you know, we did that 5,000 miles in 28 days, too, which is another crazy thing. We had a crew of five and a pr uh, principal cast of four people. Um, so it was extremely small. I'll, I'll get to those details in a minute. But uh, one more question, David. How yeah. do you want to do questions? So give it this sort of. <laughs> you can blur them out, and, okay. and I'll I'll adjust. Cool. Um, were Were you influenced by Into the Wild? Uh, that That was on my watch list. I'm. Uh, we can do influences. I mean, I can do them now. I mean, uh, my biggest influences are really Terrence Malick, uh, Andre Tarkovsky, um, uh, Bazan. Um, a lot of, the University of Colorado, to backtrack slightly, is an experimental film school. And so there's a lot of emphasis on film as art, um, and which was really interesting to me because I grew up film-wise in, in an atmosphere that said narrative film was not art, it was entertainment, and it's fine over there in the entertainment world, but experimental film is art. Um, and so I, that didn't jive well with me, and that's part of the reason I stayed at the University of Colorado so long is because I really I needed to work that out. It didn't seem right to me, although I really respected my mentors and the, the teachers that were saying this. It was sort of a very modernist um, perspective that they were kind of pushing on me, and, but it was great for me because I had to grapple with that, and I really had to justify all my choices formally and aesthetically um, in a much different way than you might at a, at a more narrative film school. Um, let's see. Here, let, I've got a photo. I'm sorry, I didn't have time because we kind of threw this together rather, rather quickly. I didn't have time to make a lovely PowerPoint for you all. I would have loved to. Um, here, okay? Need some more room? Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to speak up? No, uh, is we okay? If you're not, if you're not good, just say so. Um, let's see, where are you? There you are. You, so here is, just to give you an idea, there's the journey of the film. Um, and so we did, we did from Boulder to Traverse City straight through, 22 hours, so it was about 24 hours straight driving. We took turns um, in the RV and just, just powered through it. Um, 
and ended up shooting uh, in a mount in the Traverse City area. Um, so the production budget, I'll go into that real quick. Um, I'll just kind of go through this in a linear fashion. The funding for this, I was in grad school, um, so of course I used a lot of student loans. Um, but I received two grants, the Gamble Family Endowment, um, which was really kind of a, a great thing. Talking to one of the people in the art department, they couldn't remember, at least 30 years back, the art department ever receiving one of these uh, named grants from the university. So it was the first time in, a, in at least 30 years that, that an art student actually got one of, the, one of these grants, which was very touching, it was, it was a great thing. And then I got a J.R. JR Hopes grant which is within the art school. The other one is, is school-wide, so it's the whole University of Colorado. So I got those two. Uh, through one of my actors, I ended up connecting with a couple of small investors and ended up getting about $6,000 from two different, um, 6,000 total from two different investors. Um, and then kind of a, this is a good lesson for you young filmmakers out there, uh, kind of a, it's both funny and tragic. Uh, my parents have been putting away tiny bits of money in case I ever get married, and they ended up giving me my wedding <laughs> fund. Uh, they spell, so that's that dedication, right? Uh, so that went in there as well. Credit cards are, I've got a couple credit cards still pretty well maxed out. So the, the production budget was a measly about $18,500, um, which is, for a feature film, is absolutely nothing. That's considered a no budget film. Um, the, to date, I've probably, I think I'm still under about 25 grand. I've, I've spent money on post-production and, and festival submission and things like that, but I'm still, by most festival standards, uh, under 25,000 is usually considered a no-budget film. You get into a low-budget film at, um, I think it's 125,000 and below. Um, so it's... By most standards, it doesn't even register. Like, I, I couldn't even apply for the Michigan Film Incentive Grant because I, I'm not even close to hitting the minimum um, on that. Uh, so let's see, student loans, credit cards. Now the scripts, um, as with all, you know, sort of low-budget films, the script I was finishing the night before we piled into the RV and took off. I finished the last couple pages um, the night before finish them uh, but it was kind of the process I had set up um, was kind of unique and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit so the script was very raw it was in its first uh, first sort of iteration um, the, I did a casting call to get my actors I did that in Boulder in the Boulder Denver area and the whole front range of Colorado um, and had did about three days of casting so folks would come in I would have a section of the script for them to read uh, we would talk about it the challenging thing about a production like this is the um, one of the first questions I asked them was, "Are you okay with camping? Are you okay with getting <laughs> dirty? Because uh, you know we might, hopefully, we'll get to shower every three days uh, if we're lucky." And so I had to get people that were willing to sort of take on the experience of this film. We had, like I said, we had at the beginning we had seven folks living in this RV. Um, the director of photography and myself usually slept outside and, and we had little what are called bivy tents, um, really small one person tents. And then the rest of the cast and crew slept in the RV at night. And we were you know, going from campground to campground. We actually got a couple nights inside at my parents' house when we here in Traverse and uh, we stayed in a hotel for one night and then at a casino. We got rained out in Nevada for a few nights, which was a riot. The Red Garter. Fantastic. <laughs> they had buckets on the floor to catch the, the rain dripping from the ceiling. It was quite an experience. Did you win any money? No, no. I played some nickel slots. Yeah. It didn't work out. Uh, but, yeah. So, back to where we were. Um, so, other pre production things. I had to try to get permits. We shot in a lot of national parks, as I mentioned. We shot in the picture of the Rocks National Lake Shore up in the UP, Devil's Tower, Badlands, um, Black Hills is a national park, but uh, Yellowstone, and of course the Bonneville Salt Flats. So what I did as a student, you know, we contacted all those places. Some of them got back to us, some didn't. Um, but we had to sort of power ahead. The beauty of being a student filmmaker is that most of the time they don't really care. As soon as they hear that it's a student film and that it's not for uh, commercial purposes, they're like, oh, okay, just don't block the sidewalks. Um, 
you know, and mm -hmm. as long as you're under five people, um, this is another note for you young guerrilla filmmakers, um, we did pretty well. We would usually check in when we got to the national parks, we would check in, um, let them know what we were doing, and uh, they were, for the most part, they were, they were great. Um, there was one incident up in, actually, out of all the places we went, uh, up in Munising, up in the UP, uh, we shot at the uh, Grand Sable Sand Dunes, uh, and a ranger came by, and we had contacted them, and they said, "Yeah, we'd love to have you shoot. It's going to be about 500 bucks a day." <laughs> and I was like, "That's like food for like two weeks, bro." <laughs> um, so I couldn't really do that. I said, "Thanks, but no thanks." Of course, we tried to shoot anyways, but we did shoot anyways. A ranger showed up, and they put two and two together, and so. About six months later, I'm at the University of Colorado teaching. I go to my teacher's mailbox and I get this thing from the, uh, it, was a, it was basically from a court in Marquette saying that I had missed a court appointment and that I had another one set up and I owed a $500 ticket uh, for shooting without a permit. And so luckily for me, it coincided when I moved back here just over a year ago. And so I actually went up there and I uh, got the public defender um, and we went in there and talked to the prosecutor, and he said, this is ridiculous. He tossed it out. Um, and so I got that taken away, which was great. But it was, it was definitely a learning experience um, for me in a lot of ways. <laughs> but it, that, that worked out in the end. So you have an alias. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we also got, we got kicked out of Badlands. Luckily, we were just finishing up shooting in the Badlands, and they asked us to, to take off. Why? Why did they kick you out? Because um, we didn't, again, we didn't have permits. They never got back to us. Um, we contact, contacted them about three months in advance and never heard back from them. Um, the, uh, the, the film festival, Doc Panel, did you sit in on that? No, I missed uh, it. It's, it's airing now in the media center and it's also on the web. Mm -hmm. There's about a 20 minute discussion. Jeff Gibbs kicks it off with exactly this subject about, in particular, public space and yeah. in particular national parks and the issues related to shooting therein. Yeah. So you might want to watch that on the web or tune into El North TV this weekend. It airs all over the weekend. Jeff. Boy. Right. Jeff. Oh, Jeff. Sorry. I didn't say it over there. Hey, Jeff. Right? Then you kick it off with that? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's bad enough if you're on a feature film, but if you're, they even have a, a rule that if you're doing sound recording, so in theory, if you're, if you're there with a the mic, you have to send them your treatment and get a permit. Right. It's very onerous. Yeah, it's, I guess it, we lucked out because at that time we were not for commercial purposes, and, and so they didn't, they weren't really concerned with us in that regard. It's funny because I've, I've talked to North Meds, you know, I've shot there a bunch of times, and they're just like, just don't bring anything onto the dunes. Right. They, they just, there are no permits required, it's all good. So I guess there's different yeah, rules each, all over the place, Each right? place is a little bit different. Yeah. Well, there are film makers going there on a regular basis, yeah, so the there's thing. no consistency across the board. You right. know? That's yeah. why if they've had experience with the film crew coming there before, they may have a little different opinion yeah. than Manitou Island. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah, in the, in the legal code in the national parks, it, it says for a professional, you know, a professional film crew. Um, and so it's really around what does that mean, right. you know, and, and so I was able basically to fight that. You know, we were students, no one was getting paid a, a, a union wage. Did you film in Yellowstone? Yeah, yeah, we did. We didn't have uh, any problems. Again, we, we checked in with Rangers and they said, you know, as long oh, as it's student shoot. Uh, this was two years ago, just over two years ago. Yeah, I'm curious if it's changed on the website. It says anyone with any equipment yeah. has to check out. Yeah, that's the law. The, yeah. uh, so, rehearsals we did. We had a couple days of rehearsal, rehearsals. This is the main actor here, Barrett Ogden, who plays Ian. Um, we were lucky enough to get into some theater space in. Um, University or the Naropa University, which is a Buddhist school in, in Boulder, and um, they have these beautiful rehearsal spaces. And both uh, Barrett and Judson Webb, there, who plays, um, uh, uh, geez, now all my characters are mixed up, isn't that terrible? The other male The other male lead male. Um, <laughs> Ryan, yes, Ryan. Um, here's some shots of. of Really, we're trying to find the characters. Um, this was an extremely collaborative process, which I'll get into a little bit when we talk about the production. Um, the script, like I said, was very raw, and so I was really relying on the talents of these guys um, to sort of find find the characters 
and we just didn't, again, without a budget, we didn't have the resources to really do weeks of rehearsal and really develop the script and characters. So we had about three, four days of, of working with the characters, working scenes, and um, sort of trying to find that. So, I also wanted to show you real quick, in my pre-production work, I did a lot of, I used Google Earth like crazy. I mean, this film's a little bit unusual because, because it travels so far, and so locations were key. So I did a ton of research on Google Earth, um, finding different locations, and I, again, I was trying to backtrack a trip that I had already taken. Um, so I was trying, I remember, you know, staying at this campground in, in the Bighorn Mountains in, in Wyoming, but I couldn't remember exactly how to get there or, or where it was, and so I was using Google Earth to, to zoom in and try to find different roads and different campgrounds, and it was really kind of a fun and amazing process. And through that, I found some locations, because people will post photos from certain things, so you can really kind of see those spots, you know, much better than, you know, from there, sort of above digital view, um, satellite view. So I found a couple of locations that are really some of my favorite locations just by using by using Google Earth, and that sort of uh, changed it. And this is, I'll show you just a, a couple seconds of this. Um, when I was proposing this to my graduate committee, I made um, this presentation when I was trying to sort of get their uh, approval to allow me to make this. I was going to make it either way, but uh, I did have to get permission. Um, so this will give you a little idea of kind of Google Earth. And again, the idea was to sort of get a sense of the journey of the film. And at some point, I'm going to remake this and use stills actually from, from the film itself and speed it up. It's a little... A little cool. did, you, did you post any stills of the film on Google Earth now? So that, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. So reciprocate for the next filmmaker who's yeah. scouting. <laughs> yeah, we've got, I've got about two, I think we had 3,000 just photos. We didn't... Sadly, we didn't have someone there actually documenting. We didn't have a, a location photographer, so we just, you know, while we were carrying stuff, we were out there just clicking away with our. With our uh, so, so, but the, what's cool about this is these are the actual photos that you use to kind of choose your location. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Exactly. And the Kingston Plains here. I don't know if folks know about this, but this place is yeah, absolutely, absolutely incredible, yeah. um, and it really plays an interesting role in the history of, of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and. and logging industry here. Um, maybe we can talk about that later. We actually didn't end up making it to the picture rocks themselves, um, so this one didn't actually make it into the film. I would have loved to, but that's a really high traffic area, and I'm sure we would have probably had problems there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a neat tool, and it, it, it helps you sort of, uh, we didn't actually go to Copper Falls either, but it helps you sort of visualize. So that's that. What else from pre-production? I mentioned we had seven folks in the RV. Um, and I bought, here I can show you some photos of that fun stuff. Um, I ended up buying a truck uh, in Denver for $900 kind of a junker, but it was it ended up being just absolutely perfect um, for the film. Here is, here's, sorry, it's tilted, but that was the only way I could get this whole thing in there. <laughs> There's the RV we rode in, and, and towing behind there is, is the picture car. A friend of mine actually gave me the camper uh, just for free that I put on the back of the truck, which was amazing because we ended up storing a ton of equipment back there because we just didn't have the storage otherwise. Um, well, yeah, and so that that was a huge blessing. And it just happened to fit because they're kind of custom, right? Uh, yeah, That's yeah, awesome. and it just happened to fit. We were really lucky. Let me see if I can show you another shot of the RV. I think I've got these got a little mixed up. Here's oh, there's the picture car. There's the truck. And I really wish I could have held on to this thing, but uh, I just couldn't. Didn't really need two vehicles and. It was a great vehicle, but I don't know. Here's some interior shots of us traveling and, and sleeping. 
when and wherever you could. Um, see us working away. And so what we would do while we were rolling down the highway, um, depending on who was driving, the actors and myself would be going over scenes. We'd be rewriting scenes as we were rolling down the highway and rehearsing them and discussing them. Now, I had been to many of the locations 10 years prior, but only once. And so we didn't really know what we were going to run into when we got there. Um, and I'll, I'll start talking about that when I get into the concepts I used in, in the production itself. Um, let's see. So other things to do, I wanted to show you Google Earth. Um, here's a, another <laughs> tip for sort of no, no budget filmmaking, young filmmakers. Production value, a lot of, you see a lot of low budget films with really sort of poor production value and, and a lot of that has to do just simply with money. My, what I really subscribe to as a, as a broke filmmaker is using location. I mean, nothing makes a more beautiful uh, an impressive location than, than nature itself. Um, so when you go out into the world, given you have issues with lighting, um, with moving cameras, with people in the background, with permits, with all these things, but it immediately, if you can get an amazing location, it immediately raises the production value of your film. Um, and so I like to think that the, the film looks much more beautiful and much more polished than, than its $18,000 budget. Um, so I, that was a, a big point to me. On, on top of the fact that landscape just played an integral role in the film, it's really uh, a character in the film. Uh, and it was important metaphorically in two ways. Um, the journey of the film sort of uh, parallels the declining health of the main character. So in, in my mind, it starts out in lush green spring Michigan. And as they travel and main character Ian's health sort of begins to fail, the landscape becomes more and more austere until the point where you know, he ends up passing away. He's in the salt flats of Utah, which is just completely white and barren. Um, and there's really nothing present. And this also sort of metaphorically parallels his spiritual journey in, in the sense that he starts out sort of holding on to things, holding on to ideals, holding on to physical objects. And throughout the process of the film, he's, he learns to let go. And he's encouraged by the people he meets and the friends he makes to, to sort of let go of objects. And so in that sense, he's sort of getting rid of things and, and everything becomes sort of clearer and more open uh, for him as well. Uh, let's see. Production logistics. We already talked about the, during the film. I showed you the map. We had seven people crammed into that RV. And then midway through the production, the, the two female actresses showed up. Here's the, uh, here's the entire cast and crew right there. That was everybody, which is pretty incredible. Um, this was our, uh, this is kind of a funny story. I won't get into it too much. This was our depressed cook um, who had just been dumped by the love of his life. Um, he hung in there. It was really kind of. I laugh about it now, I felt horrible for him, but it was, it was the kind of thing where he'd be like, here's your food, it's probably not any good. <laughs> yeah. and he kind of became, he was kind of an Eeyore type character. <laughs> uh, but we had fun, and he really came around. I think the journey was really good for him. Um, of course, there's myself. This was uh, a Hallie Schwartz, young actress. She was only, I think, 22 at the time. Actually, she has family here in Traverse City, which was kind of neat. Um, she was a student in one of my recitations at the university, fantastic actress, um, and she was acting with people that were all in their 30s to late 30s and really held her own. I've never had anybody say, what's she doing hanging out with these older people? Um, she really did a great job. My cinematographer's hiding back here, had a band who was, I couldn't have done the film without him. He did everything. He was a producer, he helped me get permits and that we did have. And, did a lot of great work. Chris is Jensen Webb, who plays Ryan, Paradox, who plays Ian, and Jen Summers up there, who plays um, <laughs> Melissa. And this was my production manager, Dawn. And this was another student of mine who ended up doing audio recording, which I'll talk about later when we get into snafus. Um, but it was a great group of people. We only had one coup, and uh, we 
solved it and worked it out. We had a lot of processing. Um, we don't need to get into that. <laughs> Let's see. To do uh, production methods. So I just wanted to talk about. I set up the production of this film in a very unusual way. We we shot the film basically um, in chronological order, which for you filmmakers here, you know, pretty much never happens. Um, the idea was to get the cast and crew together and actually take the journey of the film, actually live the journey of the film in real time. Um, for me, I thought it was was brilliant. It was a huge gamble, you know, because you were there were the chance of blow ups and things going horribly wrong. But I really wanted that to flavor the film. You know, we got sick of the rain. It rained almost through the entire film. Um, but you just sort of adapted, and you had to really. Part of my goal was to go out into the world, arrive, and accept whatever was there, adapt, adjust, and, and just allow the universe and nature to play a role in the film. Um, to not have this dogmatic idea of this scene is going to be this way, um, and this is how we're going to do it. And here are, I'll show you a couple examples of where that sort of panned out in an amazing way. So. This is a, a scene that I absolutely love, which is in the back of the truck. Um, I won't show it to you. But anyways, the, the main character just wants to be alone. The character that's with him, Ryan, is a talker, has definite issues with other people's property. Uh, and the poor lead character just wants to be alone. And so they're stuck in the back of this truck, and the, the secondary character just won't stop talking. And he just blathers on. And it's a four and a half. Show it. It's great. I, 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 I'll show you a little bit. Yeah. We, we don't need to, to see the whole thing. It's was it? It was was it raining that night? It was raining. See, yeah. this this scene was actually my point was this scene was actually supposed to be shot at a campsite um, next to a fire on, on a picnic bench, um, but it was raining, and so we found this campground. This was along Lake Superior. I'm trying to remember where the heck we were, um, but we I bought this tent. There was a a covered picnic area that the sidewalk here came out from. So we unloaded all the gear, we put up this tent, backed the truck into it, and we were able to do a dolly move. So the camera is slowly moving into the back of the truck over about five and a half minutes. Um, it's a really, really just creeping slow move. Um, but it ended up working great, and, and it captured the claustrophobic feel because you're just stuck in that back, the back of the truck with, with this guy, and it's really something. The Dolly the universities or yours? Uh, that was the universities, yeah. I was very blessed to... Was it a motor dolly? No, no, nope, nope, it's just a doorway. Oh, wow. Just a simple doorway. Um, we were going to bring track until we realized there was nowhere to put it. Um, you need to carry it. Yeah, or something. So this gay guy walks into a bar, right? And he's got this parrot on his shoulder. And he walks in. The parrot looks at the bartender square in the eye. He says, Shit. I never got the punchline of that joke. fanatic for a lot of years, but now, lately I've been into craps. Big time. Two, three years maybe. Really into it. That's a pretty good run, too. I mean, man, there's nothing like when you're at the craps table, and the table's hot, and you're hot, and everybody's betting on you to stay hot. Man. That energy gets moving. It's like being in some kind of crazy energy tornado. It is a lot of fun. A lot. So, 
he goes on and on here. Um, what you can see, I'll show you the dolly move here. If you watch it, fast forward, um, you can kind of see the whole move there. So it's incredibly slow once it's moving, but it is a significant move. So that was one of the sort of great gifts that we got um, just in, in the process of, of shooting the film. Um, whoops. And, well, so there you can see sort of the setting up in the back there. Those were C-stands or whatever you guys had? Yep, to do? yep, we had some C-stands. Uh, I was, what I ended up doing is we wired lavalier microphones from, from the ceiling. Mm. Um, and so that's me wiring the lobs down, and we have boom operating as well. Um, but the lobs ended up being the winners in the audio battle. Definitely some issues with audio, but we can talk about that later maybe. Um, let's see, I want to show you another. We had another location along the way that we were driving up in the UP, and we ended up just pulling over. Um, here, let me show you. This was. Just incredible. Uh, it was one of those things we were driving along, and oh, here it is right here. And we couldn't help but stop and, and shoot this. <clears throat> and while we were shooting, what was kind of crazy about it, the owner showed up. And here you can kind of see it. And she was like, What are you doing? And we just started asking her questions about it. And she warmed up to us and ended up just saying, don't hurt yourselves and go nuts. Um, but it was an old uh, rock crushing building um, from years and years ago. You know, the ceiling was off. There was trees growing in through the windows. It was just an incredible. And there was actually an artesian well in the corner. So there was this amazing sound of this water sort of trickling. Um, beautiful. Actually, I don't know how, but we didn't get a shot of that. Um, then we also had we had a incredible, there it is, rainbow. We are driving uh, west of Cody, Wyoming. I wore some memorabilia. I got this hat in Cody. And this shirt's actually in the movie, too. But, um, you know, this was the kind of thing. Someone got on the walkie-talkie, and they're like, hey, look to your left. And we're like, oh. So we had to pull over, and we just kind of created, uh, we ended up shooting, and this made it into the film. Uh, the light was just fantastic. So we were really sort of loose and um, really sort of took everything that was given to us and you, you had to make the best of what you, what you had at the time. Um, as far as going and jump into the production, I think that's... The other interesting thing production-wise with shooting in this way and having the actors and cast sort of live the, the experience of the film there's no going home. I mean, given we had cell phones and things like that, but it wasn't like the actors showed up for work, they played their part, you know, they got into character and did their thing, and then they go home and they watch TV and hang out with their friends or their wife or whatever the case may be. They were in the film. They were in the story of, of this journey from the beginning to the end. There was no escape, really. Um, and so that... That was really fantastic. I think for them, the feedback I got was that uh, was that was really interesting, and I think it really worked for all of us. It was a, it's the kind of thing you could only do with a small cast and crew. You couldn't do this with a large budget film, really. Um, again, there's just too many moving parts, but it works uh, in our in our circumstance. Um, one more thing that happened that was just a gift. We were out uh, trying to shoot. Oh, I think I'm gonna show this to you later. You like that? That's a be intimidating shot. Actually, I'm going to talk about that when we get into things that went wrong. <laughs> uh, I'll go into production gear here real quick. What I shot the film on was this beauty right here. This is a, a Sony EX-1. And what I ended up doing is buying this guy here, which is a lens adapter. If I can get it out. Um, this little guy here. And this was about 3000 bucks, roughly. Here's a little bit better picture, and that's in the Porcupine Mountains and up in the UP. So what you have here is you've got the camera body right here. Uh, this is the Sony EX-1. Then we attach this guy, like so, on there. And 
and then we're, we're able to use SLR still camera lenses on the front of this. Now what's inside here, what makes, makes this special, is that there's a piece of ground glass, and there's actually a battery, and you hit this little button here, and the ground glass actually vibrates inside there. And so what this does is it gives the image a uh, grain, almost like you would have with film. It, it sort of gives it a, a grain sense. It also gives you the really shallow focus that you get from a lot of the DSLR cameras that people are shooting with now. So we have the benefit of that filmic look of, of shallow focus, or shallow, shallow depth of field, and, uh, and a bit of grain as well. To me, it really... Did, did you choose that over a Red Rock Micro for any technical or price point reasons? Uh, price was a big part of it. Um, I mean, I got the case. This guy, this is their, their mid version, so it's actually got, you can control the back focus. Um, and I got the rails, and it was, it was like 2,700. Um, it was very reasonable. And we already had, um, this, the university had EX1s. Um, and we chose the EX1 over the HVX, mainly because of, sorry for the techie stuff. If, if you're not interested, we'll be done soon. <laughs> but. Uh, Mainly for storage reasons, um, you know, because I ended up with about 800 gigs, 32 hours of footage, um, and if we had shot, you know, with the HVX at full 1920, we would have, I uh, would have been carrying around hard drives like crazy. We were already frightened enough of, of something happening to the hard drives as it was. Um, so that's a bit of that. I talked about the audio. We use basically lavaliers most of the time. We had some issues with those. Um, no, no external, uh, no zoom devices, separate audio recorder? We had a Marantz. Okay. We used a, a small Marantz. Um, audio. Yep, yep. And uh, just went to that. We either went to that or into the camera. We usually had two going into the camera just so I wouldn't have to deal with syncing audio. For those of you who don't know, usually, like especially with shooting film, it's a two system process because the film and the audio are separate and then you have to marry them in the post production. And it, it takes a bit of work that way. The, the nice thing about video is usually you can use, you can see here actually, these uh, are receivers for two lavalier microphones that run the actors, and that goes directly and is recorded with the image and onto the camera, which is nice because everything is, is synced up and ready to go. Um, Do you have a gen portable generator? No, sir, but that's a great, great question and story. This actually, when we went to shoot here, this was about a two mile, two and a half mile hike. Uh, up to the Lake of the Clouds Overlook. We hiked way out there, and I, I didn't queue up any of those photos. Um, but the two actors, myself and the camera guy, packed in um, the two and a half miles carrying all the equipment. And let's see. And we stayed the night, got absolutely brutalized by gnats the next morning. It was insane. Um, but we weathered through it, and unfortunately, it didn't. Here we are. We didn't end up using a whole lot of the footage. I'd love to see. Here you can see. Okay. Here's Adam. This is one of the shot. No, we didn't use a shot. Um, he was a bit of a daredevil, and that scared the bejeebus out of me doing that with the camera. Um, there he is, and you can see one of the shots we did a time lapse uh, with one of the characters actually standing out here. That didn't make it into the film, but that's all that got used from this adventure. And so what I ended up doing is I bought a, there's me carrying this unbelievably huge pack. What I had, I bought a battery generator. It was basically, it's like a car battery in a case, but you can, you can power some lights. I got some LED, or I'm sorry, uh, fluorescent, uh, 300 watt equivalent, great big fluorescent tube lights. Um, and I hauled that generator in the back of this backpack two and a half miles with all my other gear uh, in there. It weighs probably, I don't know, 35, 40 pounds. Um, and it was Jetson with his, his equipment and Barrett. And I think there we are hiking along. It was really, this was kind of one of the highlights of the trip, part in the nighttime photos. And so we shot Sunrise. We did a time lapse of. Uh, one of the characters, like I was saying, on the ridge, and he stood there, he almost killed me afterwards. He, he both loved me and hated me for, for doing this. We, um, he stood there for, uh, I think it was an hour and 20 minutes, and it, at dawn, and it was raining, and he just stood there, and he just had to stand, this, this 
careful as possible. He was on the edge of this huge cliff and uh, just kind of had to take it. Luckily, he is a Buddhist and, and kind of just got into this whole meditative mindset. And he said he went through these incredible extremes of absolutely wanting to kill me and, and just being so touched and blown away by how beautiful it was because he was just forced to stand there and, and look. Um, so that was kind of one of the interesting challenges there. Here, I think you can see us battling. There's Judson itching for gnats. I don't know if we got any photos of, uh, actually, I think we do. I'll show you real close up real quick. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> and, uh, so that was another. Uh, we also used a lens baby. Um, which I, I won't get into. We don't, we don't need to really talk about that. Uh, Post-production. So moving right along, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Um, so normally what's, what's done in, in productions is, uh, most of the time with narrative film, people use what's called continuity editing. Um, the basic premise there is you try to um, create, through editing, you create a, you use image and sound to create a continuity of time and space. Is kind of the idea. And so, even though a film may be shot over many, many months, um, you may shoot two shots that end up next to each other in a film on you know totally different months. You use editing to create this sort of continuity of time and space. Um, and there's a lot of rules in filmmaking that help you sort of make that make sense to the viewer's mind. Um, Myself going to an experimental school, I, I looked at this, and again, I'm, I'm looking at this from a, a different, slightly different perspective. And so I came up with this idea um, to use what I what I call dissociative editing. And so my premise is that you have five elements: you have image, sound, time, space, and what I call a narrative stream. So what I what I propose is that you need to use one of one of four elements, at least one of four elements, to maintain the narrative stream. The narrative stream is sort of an, an ephemeral, it's, it's hard to sort of put your finger on, but it's the, the sense of we're moving forward. Um, the story is sort of continuing. It's not breaking. It's, it's sort of the flow of consciousness. Now, you can use image to maintain that. You can use image and sound to maintain that. Um, what I propose is, as long as that narrative stream is held together by one of these elements, the other three can go off and do their own thing. Um, and this really sort of opens up possibilities for a more poetic um, cinema, really, in a lot of ways. So often I'll use audio to sort of ground the audience in the sense that, okay, this thing, um, the, the story is moving forward in a chronological, in a linear way, and yet the image might jump around, or you might get perspectives in space that are unusual. And it, it allows you to say more about what's happening. You can get into sort of more psychological representations of what's happening. Um, and it just it really opens up the filmmaker's bag of tricks a lot more. I'll, I'll show you a, a couple of quick examples. Um, Obvious um, question, David. You're, you cut this yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. And you're looking forward to doing that. that that's something that you're into? I uh, do love the editing. Cool. Yeah, um, and that's kind of what I'm doing mostly now professionally. Um, although it's not um, quite as exciting and interesting footage. Um, so here's here's a section of what I call the social editing. Sure, I'll just hold it. I can't. That's okay. a whole bunch. That's a lesson. Hey, I don't need your help. I don't need help from someone who's weaker than me. You make me sick. What are you going to do? With this month. Huh? What, what, with this month? The next year? Five years? Huh? What are you gonna do? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing! I wish you would just go and leave me alone. You're not my friend. You don't owe me anything. Just go. Hey, hey. I don't. 
want your pity or your help. I just want to be alone. But next town, drop me out. So that's one example, and I won't go too deep into the theory. There, it's not, there, it's not, the techniques I'm using aren't unique. The jump cut's been around for a long time, um, really since editing, and really since Godar, but it's, I'm using it, I like to think I'm using it in a slightly different way. I'm not trying to break, this is really hard to do. Um, I'm not trying to break the continuity, per se. I'm not trying to break your sense of being in the film. I'm not trying to push the audience out of the film by having this, these dissociative elements. Um, what I'm trying to do is give you a different perspective and help you think about the character in a psychological way. Um, Does it feel more raw to you? It, uh, it doesn't really feel raw to me, but I'm so used to seeing it. Um, and, and I think this is... I don't think I've come close to reaching its sort of full potential. I think it's really, I'm just at the beginning of, of the potential of the theory um, or the method. Uh, here's another sort of example. Again, the audio sort of leads and, and holds. Sorry, this is the, I'm going wrong. Okay. Okay, here's one more. Some people have a real issue with, I hear their voice, but they're not talking, yeah. you know, and, and things like that. And I think, I mean, our visual language is always evolving. Like, I think for younger and younger generations, the jump cut is no big deal. We read right over it now, um, where it used to be a really big deal. Um, and so I think it's generational, its effect is generational a little bit that way. Um, but it does, yeah, I mean, f for me, it came out of, both reading and out of necessity. 
uh, a lot of times, like the first example I showed you, we only had one angle. Yeah. Um, you know, so I had nothing to cut to. Right. You know, right. so I had yeah, to use. Right. Yeah. right. I had to creatively come up with with solutions for that. And again, that was a problem with this style of shooting is that we didn't have. Usually, you shoot a scene, you get a wide shot, a medium shot, and a close up, um, and you might get several different close ups, uh, and then hopefully some B roll. Basically, we got one shot, and then we had to pile into the RV and get going. Um, so it was. It was a whole, editing wise, I had to get real creative, which is, I prefer, honestly. I'd, I'd rather have interesting challenges to overcome than to go out and do a reshoot. So, so David, just to clarify, this yes. shot with the truck where they're, where, yeah. uh, you know, sitting in there and he's outside talking to him, was that several takes that you mixed in there? Or yeah. Was it, okay. Yeah. It wasn't just one take, it was a bunch of different takes. One camera position, yeah. several different takes, yeah. Yeah, because I saw it was static and at one point it was moving. Yeah. So. I mean, another big challenge was just chasing the light. We were running out of sunlight, so we had to do, we didn't have time to go in and get close-ups. Sure. Um, and the light wouldn't match and things like that. So we had what we had, um, yeah. and we just kind of... Did you have a preference for shooting, like, at Magic Hour, or was it whatever you, wherever, whenever you were there? And... I would shoot Magic Hour all the time if I could. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, but there's, there's, you know, obvious challenges with that. It only lasts about 10, 15 minutes, um, yeah. and it's shifting quickly. Yeah. Um, but it is magic, magic hour for a reason. I mean, the light, both sideways light and the color, is is really special. Um, but you basically were going for whatever was there at the time you arrived. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Well, lastly, I wanted to get into some of the problems we had, um, which were really not that bad, but there were definitely some mm -hmm. issues. Uh, one of which was we had, the RV had two flat tires, oh. um, which killed us. We had to you know, get those fixed, patched, and, and refilled up. And then the trailer that was pulling uh, the picture car, we were cruising along at about midnight, one o'clock, trying to get to uh, South Dakota. And the trailer started feeling weird in the RV. It was kind of pulling a bit. So we pulled over and discovered that the tread had come off of one of the tires that the, that the picture car was on. Um, that was frightening. So we took the picture car off and drove it on its own and went to a town the next day. And you know, we lost half a day getting, getting new tires on. Um, so that was, that was one of the challenges. Um, we had one trip to the hospital. Uh, I think I no production that. insurance, right? No. No. Oh, but, but how about uh, no no production insurance at all? No. no. Wow. No. no liability for equipment, none of that. University. Liability was covered for equipment via the university. Okay, university. So the okay. university, all the equipment was covered. What about, insurance but, what about people wise? No. But I think it, yeah. No. Did they, no. Sign, did they sign off on that or did it was no. just verbal? It was, it was a handshake as, yeah. as it often is. Um, again, films like this don't get made for those reasons. Right. And those are good reasons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to not make a film. Uh, case in point, he's smiling in that photo, but he wasn't about three minutes later. He slipped. This is uh, Eric, who was, I think he was 21. He was one of my students again. He slipped on this rock and hit his tailbone on one of these nubs. Um, and shortly thereafter, couldn't feel his toes. Uh, that was very frightening. And so we took him to the hospital, and um, of course, then he got some pain pills and forgot to eat and got sick from that, poor guy. But after a couple days, he was he was a trooper. And he was fine. Um, but that was that was very frightening. Um, but we made it through that. The other thing I wanted to show you was uh, we went to the salt flats. Well, when I was looking on Google Earth, things aren't all the same on Google Earth as they are in the real world, um, or at least they don't look quite the same. So we I thought this area was further away from everything, and so I wanted to go to the we wanted to go to the salt flats, but I wanted to get away from areas that would be highly trafficked, so I wanted to go way down one end of the salt flats. Well, it turns out it's not actually salt down there. It's mud. Um, so we got there, and we hiked um, this wheelchair and all of our equipment out here, and you can see this was, this was the final epic, crazy beautiful finishing shot, the last shot of film. You know, we were 26 days into this whole adventure. Um, just wanted to get this thing finished. <clears throat> we went out here and it, this was a disaster. <laughs> it was just a disaster. They couldn't, you can see the mud caking on the, on the wheels here. 
with a wheelchair. The idea was that he was going to roll this wheelchair off into the distance, basically until they disappeared, hopefully in a heat wave, which never happened at all. But <clears throat> so this was sort of, again, we have another amazing blessing in disguise. We hiked out there, we tried to shoot, it didn't work at all. And off in the distance, you can't see it here, but this incredible thunderstorm came rolling through. We had a flash flood. <clears throat> we raced back to our car and started heading back. And the flash flood came and completely blew out the road that we were on. Uh, and that's where this uh, comes from. So right here, you can see the river flowing. <clears throat> this was just complete circumstance or happenstance. And so what we ended up doing, we got the camera out and shot it. Um, and it made it into the film. I can show you here real quick. It's a, it's a great little scene. Um, and I couldn't, it's the kind of stuff you just, you can't really script. Uh, okay. production you're talking about uh, hard drives and stuff I mean when you moved your media off to hard drives you know as you shot it mm -hmm. did you have dual hard drives did you back stuff up yeah I bought I had two two terabyte um, rated drives they were RAID zero though you know they weren't redundant um, so yeah we would copy it to one and copy it to the second um, Basically, didn't, right didn't mail one off periodically back to Travers or back to Denver. Or no, we kept them in different parts of the RV. Okay. And across <laughs> our fingers. Yeah. Uh, and so far, so good. I, yeah, I keep them keep them pretty well backed up. Um, <clears throat> I think that's about that's about it. Um, the two investors who you got about six grand from, mm -hmm. they see anything back yet? Do you no. Have no. No. No, I mean, I'm not, no. <laughs> I mean, where the film's at now, it's being sent out to festivals. I've, it's been a, a tough go so far. Uh, it's really challenging, and it's a rough learning experience. But <clears throat> I think I've, I've, I've got it off to about 18 festivals right now. I've already collected 20 rejection letters. Um, Wait, 18 festivals and 20 rejections? It's, it's off to 18 right now. Oh, sorry, got I'm it. waiting to hear from. Oh, and I've already gotten 20, that. so you're basically yeah. 38. Yeah, so far I've submitted wow. to 38, and from varying varying sizes. I actually, you know, it's a, it's an interesting process, and I just try to keep the faith. I mean, I, I personally think it's a, a really special and beautiful film. Um, the responses I've had from people that have seen the film have been fantastic, um, but it just hasn't hasn't gotten over that hump um, for various reasons. It's it's definitely a slower film, um, and it's a little bit maybe more, more European in, in its pacing in some ways, and it's a definitely sort of an independent that way as well. Um, but that's that's been a rude awakening. Talk, talk a little bit about your festival strategy, David. What what are you what festivals are you shooting for first? And well, there's a there is sort of a process to that. You know, you start with Sundance, or at least I started with Sundance because that's kind of certain festivals require a world premiere status um, and. Sundance is one of those, so I just sort of began submitting there, and then you start submitting to other festivals that also require, the really big ones require a world premiere, and I've sort of worked my way through the big ones, I haven't got into any of those, um, and you work your way down into smaller and smaller uh, festivals, um, and hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll get in front of the right person. Um, so, so you're basically shooting for all the Oscar-eligible festivals first? Uh... 
I'm not really you all that concerned like about that. I mean, there is, I think that would play more a role if you're doing a short, like the Oscar shorts. Um, I mean, going from an $18,000 budget to an Oscar would be, I mean, that would be a true, uh, <laughs> that would be something to talk about. Grand Candy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I would love to get into a, a good sized festival and win some awards, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's just, you just never know. You yep. don't know. That's the really hard thing for young filmmakers is, uh, I mean, no one knows who I am. No one knows who my actors are. Um, so, you know, when it comes into a festival and they're looking at it, you know, they go, well, we don't recognize any of these names. Do they, I don't know if they even watch the film. Or maybe they watch the first five minutes. The first five, ten minutes of this film are, are very slow. Um, I kind of designed it that way. I made my characters at the beginning of the film sort of unlikable in a way because I really wanted an, an actual character arc. I really wanted them to go through some transformation. Um, and it's the kind of thing you really need to watch the whole film to really appreciate it. Um, it is a huge, it is an epic story and a, and a long journey from beginning to end. It's kind of incredible um, once you've seen the film to, to, you know. How does the finished piece compare to your script that you uh, were finishing the night you left? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, there's a lot, out of the 32 hours of footage we have, there's, there's a lot of great scenes that didn't make it. Um, when I started uh, talking to people, you know, the advice I got from professionals, you know, like Rich Brower and, and other folks locally, were just 90 minutes, it needs to be 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. Um, and there's definitely, again, that plays into the festival thing. The festivals are looking for 90 minute films, the shorter the films are, the more films they can play, the more people they get in the seats. Um, it all makes sense, it's all business in that way, but you know, I stupidly went out to make something artful and something that moved me. Um, it's not, hopefully it's not really stupid. I mean, it's, it's the reason I make film is, is to express what I need to express and discover what I need to discover. Um, so, that, I mean, when art meets the business, you know, ugly things happen sometimes. <laughs> so the university accept this and it's your you yes, yeah, yeah, they, they passed me. I was actually kind of disappointed. I, I went into my thesis defense, and we talked about the film quite a bit, and they had a lot of things to say, but uh, I asked them about the 35-page written defense I had written, and, and my, one of my committee members was like, I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about the theory. I'm not worried about the, the written thesis. And I was just like, what do, you yeah. do you even read it? I mean, uh, so I, I guess I did okay there as well. But yeah, it was, it was accepted. And um, I got rave reviews from my mentor. Um, he said some very, very kind um, things. And he had a great influence on the film. Um, uh, so it's, I'm just waiting. Just got fingers crossed and waiting. Are there any, any other questions on the story technical or anything? Yeah, well, just a uh, business thing. Um, yeah. Are you think, are you, do you have a game plan after if not, the festivals will work out, right? Yeah. But after that for some maybe more off the wall kind of things, so, you know, such as without a box or releasing it as webisodes on YouTube, you know, and trying, which you can get paid for if you yeah. start to get more views. Have you, do you have a game plan for that kind of aspect of it too? Or are you just kind of feeling it out as it goes? I mean, I'm using without a box. That's what I've done all my submissions through. Sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, if I get to that point, I, I still have faith, and I'm not giving up on, on festivals. And, sure. But there's yeah. nothing wrong with getting like 30,000 views an episode, you yeah. know, on, on YouTube and yeah. saying, hey, you know, 30,000 30, people yep. saw every 10 minutes of it that I put up. Right. Know, right? Oh, yeah. Right, right. That's, that's kind of the next step. I mean, there are a lot of different avenues for self-distribution, sure. and, and that's changing, that the industry's changing.